Hello, I'm Margaret Casley Hayford and I'm Chancellor of Coventry University. I'm also Chair of Shakespeare's Globe and I'm a non-executive director on the board of the co-op group. And I'm delighted to be able to talk with you today and welcome to the inspiring leadership series. Margaret, thank you very much. It's really fabulous having you on the series. And uh, you were recommended by Charlotte Velour, who used to be the chair of the IOD, where you did some amazing work. You've done so many different things. And to have been awarded the CBE is a huge honor for the work you've done for the country. Uh, and, and you've touched the lives of so many people. So it's, it's lovely having you on the series. Let's perhaps uh, talk a little bit more about the, the multitude of different things you're doing from the co-op to, uh, to Coventry, to um, the, the, in the work you're doing with uh, acting and things like that. Just, just give us a flavour of what you're doing now and then we'll go back to early childhood. Yes, certainly. So um, on the board of the co-op, I am a member nominated director, which basically is a non-executive director that also goes through an election process, which is actually one of the most nerve wracking things I've ever been through. Um, because essentially, the, the very first time you go through the process, you, you don't really know what is involved um, because you've been through the normal non-executive interviews and so on. And then you've succeeded in going through that. And then the de democratic membership of the co-op, because it's such an ethically um, highly principled organization, it operates through a democracy. The democracy then um, takes you through its own process to see whether they think you're the right sort of individual to be part of their, their board leadership. And I'm so delighted because I, I love the ethic of the organization and its values. So to have been um, elected onto the board through that process was wonderful. Mm. The first time, the second and third times was just exhilarating. <laughs> so this is my third term. Wow. Um, and it, got, it gets increasingly nerve wracking as you go along because of course, um, then they really know you. The first time I thought, well, they don't know me from a hole in the ball. And uh, so if they vote for me, it will be really very interesting to see you know, whether I manage to get through. And if they don't, I'll put it down to experience. And then after that, I really wanted it to, so much to be um, re-elected re because I love the organisation. I love everything it stands for. Um, and so, yes, I'm on the board of the co-op and I'm also um, chair of Shakespeare's Globe, um, which is... Uh, as you know, a, a theatre specialising in um, early modern writing, and in particular the writing of, of the, the great man himself, um, from a, a site that was built by um, Sam Wanamaker, basically as near as he could place it on the site of Shakespeare's original theatre. Mm. Um, and, and it has both a performance side, but also an education side. So it off, off, offers um, uh, academic support um, for the performance, with performances, but also um, uh, graduate and PhD courses through uh, part partnering with um, King's College London um, and the Guildhall. And uh, it's just an incredible organisation in terms of its outreach through um, Southwark and working with uh, Southwark schools as well um, as other enterprises. So I'm very, very proudly um, involved with, with, with the Globe and also um, uh, Chancellor of Coventry University, which is just a superb university because it does everything it can to make higher education more easily accessible for a wide, a wide, wide well, the widest possible group of people. Mm. So to the point where we have um, quite a, um, a, a, a different, um, form of entry. So we have a January entry as well as a September entry. We have um, a, a blended tuition through online as well as physical. Mind you, everybody, because of the pandemic, everybody's sort of caught up with that. But we mm. were at the, very much the forefront of mm. that. Um, and then I do numbers of other things as well. So um, I, I advise young entrepreneurs. I um, advise the Metropolitan Police. Um, I, I, yes, I just, I do numbers of different things. And as you say, I met, I, I, I came through uh, to this organization, um, your inspiring leadership organization through Charlotte, because she and I have done work on governance, quite a bit of work on governance. And I, I'm an advisor to the um, IOD's um, uh, special uh, governance, um, uh, well, specialist center 
mm. of, of gov uh, um, governance oversight. And it really is extraordinary because the individuals that, that populate that are some of the greatest governance intellects. Um, in business and in in, in, in in academe and I just feel very privileged to be part of the organization. Yeah well I mean learning seems to have been a big theme running through your life and if I'm right were you not at one of the colleges at Oxford when you at some stage did you? Yes indeed I was at Somerville and um, uh, I read uh, jurisprudence. Yes as... Yeah. The subject is called in at Oxford yeah. which is which is uh, just I mean it's such an honor to um, have had that opportunity and I was recently made a, a, an honorary fellow of Somerville Lovely. which is Lovely. one of the highlights of my life <laughs> yeah. um, no, I've, I've, I've been blessed yeah and, um, and and also were you not lucky enough to work was it with Charlie at John Lewis yes indeed yes so basically um, there have been numbers of lawyers in my, my, my father's family and so I was sort of ambivalent about going into the law and, and I, I, I for a time um, uh, wanted to be a, a dancer so I worked in um, uh, local government legal offices whilst I was doing um, sort of ballet classes and and then then I, I and I, I got a sort of insight about the way that um, government legal departments um, organize all of our lives really the systems side of things and I I then went into um, planning and development uh, law and um, when I when I qualified and I was a planning and development lawyer for 20 years wow. um, and numbers of our clients were retail clients we worked for Marks and Spencer, Sainsbury um, and, and, and um, Virgin and, and so on and um, and so I, I did have quite an insight into into mm. retail and so when I was asked whether I would like to go in-house to John Lewis partnership, again, because it was an organization with a very high ethic, um, mm. having been founded by this amazing principal, princi amazingly principled um, uh, John Speed and Lewis, I just thought, my goodness, that's a dream come true. So I went in-house and I, I was recruited actually by um, Sir Stuart Hampson and, the, and I, I, mm. I was there, as you say, under the uh, auspices of, of Charlie Mayfield as um, executive chair. And it was a... A really really fascinating time um it was on a massive growth um in both the waitrose and the um um the, the, the department store side as well of course as the online side mm. which was really prescient um of charlie to take the, the organization into that side to do so yes it was really mm. busy really go ahead and um very dynamic and it was a great time to be to be there well, um, it's very interesting because the second podcast I did, I think uh, we're now at 140, uh, was with Dame, uh, not then, but she is now Dame Alison Nimmo, uh, the Crown Estates CEO and, and a lovely lady who I was honoured to coach. And uh, uh, she had, I'm sure, uh, a John Lewis chairman, and it might have been Sir Stuart who was he, with her. Was it was right? indeed. Yes, it was Sir Stuart because um, he, when he, um, he, 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 retired he went to work for the crown estate mm. as chair and it was really interesting actually because she and i overlapped uh, in something much earlier i, I mentioned that i did work for uh, mark suspenser mm. um and their flagship store was the manchester um oh yes, yes. store that was bombed by the ira yes. yeah and she at that stage was ceo of the, the um mm. Mm. the city council's task force for rebuilding um, Central Manchester, which really they wanted to do as quickly as possible to demonstrate that the city was bouncing back from this appalling tragedy. Mm. So um, I was working opposite her because Mark Spencer were my clients and she is an inspiring leader. She's an yeah. amazing woman. It was fantastic to see the way she corralled all these huge um, enterprises, talents, people with different um, objectives to make sure that we really steamed through all of the bureaucracy that we would otherwise have had yeah, to, yeah. to deal with in order to make sure that the city bounced back as quickly as possible. Yeah, really, no, really impressive. Great, great. Leadership. Well, um, I'm sure you've got some amazing friends and contacts that you built up over the years. Let's take you back to childhood. So uh, who was it that influenced the values and the, uh, 
the woman you are today, who others describe as a very inspiring leader, you're far too humble to say that, but I can say that. Um, where did the influence come from? Just tell us about uh, growing up and, and some, some factors that influenced you today and what you stand for. Ah, uh, gosh. Well, I mentioned that, that my father's family has a, 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 a sort of a great line of lawyers. They weren't just lawyers. My father's, my, my grandfather was a politician. Mm. Um, he was also a journalist and a campaigner. And um, so it's something that's sort of quite embedded in the family. And uh, my father talked politics all the time around the, the dining table. He, and, um, uh, and my mother um, was, she was, just the most, most incredible superwoman. Um, she, I mean, we, it's really interesting. My brothers and I, when we look back, we can't believe how much she managed to juggle all at once in terms of um, uh, having a job at the British Council, which mm. I know she did well, um, at the same time being a superb cook, at the same time being an excellent gardener, um, growing her own vegetables. And it was just this incredible, and just being there for all of us. Mm. And at the same time, giving they both gave us this incredible ethic of um, public service. Um, so, I mean, when she retired, she lived in Church Hanbury in, in, in Oxfordshire, and she was very much the sort of, um, I don't know whether you listen to the, the Archers, she was the sort of Linda Snell character who corralled everybody into doing things and organizing the fate and the, you know, and so on. And um, she's, she's, she was, she was extraordinary. And, and it was very much, um, public service was very much something as that was part of the ethic of the family. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and, the, and making sure that we understood that we should hand the baton on mm. um, to other people was, mm. was again, something that was very much at the heart of everything we did. But then understanding that we were a privileged black family and that we shouldn't allow people to say, but you're different. Because that's one of the things that is that I do find really quite um, uh, divisive that people will say, well, I don't understand why the others can't be like you. The thing is that um, white people and black people are the same. There are some people who are lucky enough to have privilege and then there are others who are not. And what we need to do is try to give equal opportunity for those who don't have the same privilege to come through as well. So saying to us as a family, well, you've done well um, and, you know, don't make excuses for these people who don't. I don't really find it a very compelling way of looking at things. For me, it's a question of recognising that others might not necessarily have had the education that one's had. Others might not necessarily have had the financial support that one's had. Others might not necessarily have had the books at home and the opportunity to understand things in context and to talk about you know, the, 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 the wider um, influences that give one cultural um, capital. You know, my father talked about Shakespeare. My father talked about, and my father was a classicist. Um, and, you know, that, that doesn't necessarily um, come to other, other people as, as, as a gift from their parents. Um, mm. It's not something that working class families necessarily have. So I'm not going to be disparaging to people who don't have that sort of benefit. What mm. I want to do is to create the widest opportunity, open the doors and say to other people, you can come in too. Let's help you get there. Um, so, um, yeah, I was very inspired by my, 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 my family because they wanted to, it, to pass the baton on. I think that's just yeah. really, really important. No, it's, it's a lovely, it's a lovely term and uh, another expression people says is remember when you make it to send the lift back down for other exactly. people uh, Absolutely. And, 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 and the reciprocity and the, and the paying it forward to two other people without any expectation of anything back in return, but just that they pay it forward to others, Absolutely. which is why this is how this inspiring leadership series began. And just as you're going to recommend another inspiring leader to be on the series it's, it's by word of mouth when i get when i get uh, agents approach me oh I, you know you're in the top two percent of global podcasts we want to have you know my boss wants to be on this one and he's going to talk about toilet roll and i go well thank you but but no actually it's it's on the basis of people saying that somebody else is inspiring rather than them 
telling me that they're inspiring that that actually is not humble or or uh, humanity or much humor but but thank you and uh, good luck um, <laughs> so so it's always quite interesting but um talking of humility um you got a cbe for uh, a lot of things but I, I i'm if i'm right you were involved very deeply was it action aid your charity that you supported T tell us uh, what the cbe was for it's uh, it's a huge award it's a it's a wonderful award and the, the the thing about awards like that is that the individual who gets it is probably not not the person who deserves it it's everybody who's worked with them and i have to say that um getting a a, a, a cb for my charitable work and, and my work for diversity is just really because people like the teams that team at action aid have been behind me action aid is an international development charity that um strives to eradicate world poverty which is just the most enormous task as you can imagine and to have at the top of your your to-do list when you wake up in the morning <laughs> and and and, and um, so in order to be um to be able to tackle it in a meaningful way it's focused very much on women and girls because if there is no money women and girls are the first to suffer women and girls won't get educated or they'll be sold into early marriage or they become the victims of, 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 of violence and can't, can't escape, or they, they're paid less when they work. Um, and, and then if they're paid less when they work, when they stop working, when they eventually um, retire, they have a pension that is, is, is poor or non-existent. And so they, have, they go into old age in poverty. So Action Aid is very much focused on um, the, the rights of for, for promoting and supporting the rights of women and girls. And um, one of the things that was fantastic for me was that Action Aid not only wanted to make sure that its work focused on the right things, but it said to itself, how can we make sure that we as advocates are doing the right thing ourselves? Mm. And so we tasked ourselves to examine the the, the whole enterprise, the whole organization, and to find out how we could be more what we called a feminist organization. Mm. And we decided it boiled down to really listening, um, listening to hear, really giving people an opportunity um, when they didn't have an opportunity to come into the room, to come around the table and to, to have their voices heard. And I'll just give you one example of that. Um, Action Aid is in, in 40 plus countries and it made a decision that it wouldn't, um, it would tread as lightly as it could. Um, it, so through its um, originally having been established in the UK, it decided to work through a federal structure. So in other words, it gave complete autonomy to all of the countries in which it has a presence. Mm. Those countries can make a decision about how they will engage with the operation and how they will deliver the reason for that is you then get a ground up mm. response that means you're actually giving to people what they feel they need and then they can do the best with that mm. you're giving them the opportunity to do the best for themselves and the benefit of that is the money goes much further because when people can do can make their own decisions operate on their own behalf they then can develop things much more efficiently and it's not just a question of saying, can I have some money, please? Can I have some money, please? Can I have some money, please? And then having to con con continue this sort of um, perpetual circle of being a, um, a recipient. Mm. It isn't that at all. Um, they're an investor in their own um, enterprise. And the efficiency that's created by that is enormous. The resilience that's created by that is enormous. Um, and 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 the, the the dignity and the confidence that comes with that is huge. Mm. So it was fantastic, and and it meant that, for example, when um, if there was an, if there was a disaster in one of the countries in which we operated, we didn't fly people in from the outside, which often happens with other agencies, um, which means that then you're using up resources because, of course, once you've flown people in, you have to find them somewhere to stay, and they they're using up. Um, bandwidth literally as well as metaphorically speaking and um, whereas we are asking people on the ground what they need and what we found was that 
people who flew in from outside very often came in with that sort of uh, what I call the clipboard mentality. Oh, yes, we'll do this and we'll do that and we'll do that. And they all look there. Everything is about the clip, the cl looking at the clipboard. It's rather like in the old days when you went into to the hospital and the doctor spoke to the clipboard rather than to the patient um, and, and didn't engage with the patient. And um, wh whereas Action Aid's perspective is the people on the ground decide what they want. And if there has been a, a, an international disaster of some kind, a terrible disaster of some kind, if the individuals are saying, this is what we want, normally the women will come forward and they will say, the children need food, the children need shelter. Whereas the clipboard individuals, the young people in white shirts will be talking about, well, let's first of all get the infrastructure right. Well, that's fine. But if the people are actually starving getting an infrastructure right might actually be completely ridiculous and a waste of time if the people are actually dying so you start to focus properly on what is actually needed it's so powerful yeah. so I, I i i i was really moved by the, the way in which the interrogation of what the organization really stood for meant really listening mm. listening and really hearing at the heart of everything they did to be a what, what we called a feminist organization uh, this is really very interesting to me, particularly because Lee's my wife and the charity she set up, which I supported in the background, but it's all been done by her. It's to support women and girls, uh, modern day slavery trafficking. So all the things you're talking about, when we went to Kenya, to the slums of Nairobi, and we worked with Hope for Teenage Mothers, it was helping 13 year old girls who'd gone through FGM and had babies to let their children be looked after in a crash so they could finish their own education could then go out and start things up. And we gave the money to the girls and to the women, not to the men, because they looked after it better, didn't blow it on drink and somebody else. Uh, and the same in KwaZulu-Natal when we set up the shipping container with the, um, the computers in the library, uh, where there's 85% unemployment, that, that it was going into the huts of the Zulu women where they, they had a microfinance system where they were helping each other with loans to each other. To, to get things done, uh, just very inspiring. Um, and one thing that triggered, uh, I've been very lucky to be mentored by a lovely lady called Nancy Klein. I don't know if you come across her in your time, but Nancy is now in her seventies. Um, she's written a number of books, Time to Think, More Time to Think. And her latest one is The Promise That Changes Everything. I won't interrupt you. And everything in her <laughs> philosophy of a thinking environment would very much fit with everything you've been speaking about there. And, and, and she's trained Lee and I to, to teach others to do that. So it, we're finding it very inspiring. Um, there's so much we could talk about, but let's uh, go through a few little sort of fast, uh, fast interacting questions, just, okay. just to get a flavor of you. Um, you talked about the CB, which must have been a, a highlight to recognize the others who'd worked with you at, at Action Aid. But if you were to pick another highlight in your life and then also a, a dark moment, which was difficult, whether it be personal or work, and, and what you learnt in both cases from the, the, the highlight and, and from a dark moment. Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, I mean, in a way, the, they, 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 they almost come out of the same, same period of my life. Um, I was a partner at Stenton's. I mentioned I, I worked in the city. Um, and according to the Law Society, I was the first black female partner, which is which is quite gratifying. I don't know if that's the case, case, but I'm pleased to, to accept the accolade if it's true. And um, it was at a period when um, we'd gone through um, quite a degree of economic growth, and then suddenly we went into the, um, the economic downturn of the 1990s. And um, during the 80s, you know, I'd worked incredibly hard, to, and and uh, I was I was still an assistant solicitor, uh, a senior assistant solicitor. Um, when the economic downturn happened in the early 90s. And, you know, suddenly I, I realized that colleague after colleague was being made redundant and, and, and gradually being laid off. And then um, there came the fateful day when I was laid off, uh, I was made redundant. And I thought, okay, well, fine, I'll go home and I'll recalibrate and I'll just have to think about what else I do if I can't be a solicitor. And uh, so I was sitting at my kitchen table um, thinking about, next steps and the phone kept ringing and it was con client after client saying well where are you and <laughs> I'm in the kitchen and, <laughs> um, and um, it was really interesting because they were saying well we know you we want you to do our work and um, can we send you the work and in fact one client actually said well I've just 
told them to put all of our papers into a box and to send them to you. And I said, well, you, you can't do that. I'm, I'm literally in my kitchen. I don't have insurance to work on my own. And the, 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 the client said, well, go and get insurance because I want you to do the work. And it, it was the most extraordinary revelatory moment because I hadn't realized my own self-worth. Mm. I didn't realize that all the hard work I put in had paid off, that I'd got this incredible client following. So I phoned another firm and I said, look, I think I have a client following that I didn't realize I had. Can I come and work with you? They said yes. Within six days of having left one firm, I was sitting in another firm and working away. And it was it, it was extraordinary. And after a year, I got a phone call from my old firm saying that they were rebuilding um, the team and would I come back? And I realized I had leverage. Um, and I did say to them, look, if I did come back, I'm not going to woo back the clients because this firm has given me a home. They've been good to me. And I think it would be inappropriate for me to woo back the clients. So you'd have to take a punt on me. But you know me because I've worked for you for years. Um, you just have to trust that I can come back and I can deliver what you expect me to deliver. And they said, all right, then that's fine. <laughs> and so on that basis, I went back and I was lucky enough to be able to rebuild my practice. Um, and in fact, without wooing the clients, numbers of the clients came back with me. And I realized not just my self-worth, but I also realized the importance of recognizing one's own brand and investing in the brand. I also realized I learned about resilience uh, and I learned about future proofing because what was really fascinating was that this, this really major firm hadn't really, um, how can I put it? They put all their eggs in, 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 in specific baskets. Do, mm. do, do you see what I mean? Yeah. And they hadn't, yeah. they hadn't future proofed themselves in quite the right way. So when I became co-leader of the team, it was wonderful because I'd had, I'd had these lessons instilled in me um, almost by default. And so I, I, I was able to build differently. Um, I, I actually um, encouraged the younger members of the team to be front facing so that they recognize that they had to build their own brand. So that if I got run over by a bus, mm -hmm. clients would feel that they, there was still someone to stay there for so that the, 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 the firm wouldn't go into meltdown and think, oh my goodness, what do we do now? We have to go out and poach somebody from outside. Mm. Um, and um, yes, it was quite a different way of working. And we built a team that was recognized um, as one of the top two planning and development teams in every single um, list of major um, law firms uh, for over a decade. And it was one, one of the proudest wow. moments of my life. It was wonderful. Wow. And, and such a lovely story. And I, and I can relate to that because there's a lovely lady called Deanna Oppenheimer, who's a very inspiring um, lady. If you haven't come across her, I think you're nodding, but uh, Deanna was also on the series and has been a great mentor to me and to my wife, Lee, and very supportive of us both. And it was when I was coaching her when she was CEO in Barclays and her exec team. And she said to me one day, she said, why are you working for your firm? I said, well, you know, I've always worked for firms. I've been in the army and PwC and now this firm and it's a PLC and I'm a managing director. She said, why do you go on your own? I couldn't, you know, I just like, you know, I've never done that. She said, you do realize that we're not hiring your firm you work for, we're hiring you. Really? All right. And so, so to just do it. And it was thanks to her, her encouraging me to have the courage to go out there and believe in myself when I hadn't. I just thought I was an institutional man, an organization person, just a cog in a wheel that, that it's transformed my life um, for, the, for the better. Um, thinking about our lives and lessons that we've learned, that was a moment for me and you've talked about moments for you when, when you did realize that the power of, uh, of, of relating to people so they hire you and you're employable, not employed. To be employed is yes. to be at risk, to be employable is to be at less risk is an old saying which I concur with. 
I'm sorry if there's a bit, bit of noise in the background. It's my dog chewing a bone quietly in the background, but don't worry about it, a uh, little puppy. Uh, as long as it's not the cables, we're okay. Um, and uh, thinking about sort of 18 year old Margaret, if you, knowing all you know now and all the experience you've got, were to go back and give yourself some advice to an 18 year old you, but it's also relevant for 18 year old uh, girls who are listening to this series, wherever they are in the world, what, what tip would you give to yourself knowing what you know now, if there's one bit of wisdom? Um, believe more in yourself. Um, and, and, and in a way that the, 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 the last um, story is a sort of illustration of that because um, it was my lack of self-belief, my lack of awareness in what I could achieve that um, kept me in, 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 in my position because I honestly would never have asked for partnership Mm. Um, mm. if it wasn't for the fact that, that, that I'd gone through that episode, which made me realise I had leverage. I had I had something that clients recognised. And I think that, that that happens often with women. And in fact, it's really interesting. I've actually interviewed um, women for roles who lack so much in self-belief that when they've come in, they've told me, first of all, about what they can't do on the job mm. specification. I can't do this, I can't do that. And I've realized in, in reading about them that they could do 85% of you know, what we'd asked for. Mm. And they've come in and told me about 15%. Mm. And so in fact, on one occasion, I was so astonished by how little belief this woman had in herself. And yet on paper, she was magnificent. I said to her, I'm going to stop the interview now and I'm going to ask you to leave the room. And then I want you to come in and be somebody else. I want to come in, I want you, you to come in and be the person who believes in you. And the fact that you can do so much of what this job is asking. Um, because you've come in and you've told me about somebody else and that's not the person you really are. Yes, yes, um, you're so right. <laughs> you're so right. And, and if I may add to your story, my wife, Lee, when she wrote her book, uh, mine was Inspiring Leadership, hers is Inspiring Women Leaders. She interviewed 200 women, which is how we interviewed the woman from Save the Children who'd gone back to Kenya to set up Hope for Teenage Mothers. And then we got involved with that. And then Lee found that she was trying to give her money to a charity from the proceeds of the book. And they wanted 100,000 a year. And she goes, I'm not gonna make 100,000 a year from the book. So she set up her own charity because without all the bureaucracy and the cars and the aeroplanes and the hotels. but but in the women she was interviewing, when she'd come to them and say, people say you're an inspiring women leader and I'd like to interview you. And they go, no, 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 I'm not. But Margaret is, go, go and talk to Margaret. Go, no, 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 that's why I'm coming to you because you don't think you are. And, I, and then they, they tell an amazing story. And she also interviewed uh, a friend of ours who's a female executive search consultant. And she said, Jonathan, if I had five pounds for every time I have a man and a woman going for a role, the man has 60% of the qualities, the woman has 95%, but the woman takes herself out. It takes her out of the whole process. He goes, I'm not quite ready yet. And the bloke goes, yeah, I could do it. Bring it on, suits me. And it just, it's just, it's a constant theme. And I think there almost needs to be a, an allowance made for that, almost a, yes. a, a, just recalibrate it. That the fact that the blokes will blag it and pretend they can do it, and the women will underrate themselves because they only have nine and a half out of 10 and they're not quite ready yet. Yes. Um, yes. It's, it's such an interesting one. Go, get, take us on to morals. And I just want to go sort of quickly around the inspiring leadership compass, uh, beginning with True North, MQ, because you've talked about John Lewis, you've talked about Action Aid, uh, you've talked about going for organizations, the co op, places which have strong ethics and, and your foundational values and their values are very aligned. Just interested in your thoughts on personal values, organizational values, and what's happened when they slip for you and how you get yourself, keep yourself back on true north rather than magnetic north, which keeps moving every year a little bit. Um, yes, I, I suppose it's all about equity and fairness. Um, and I, gosh, um, <laughs> it, uh, Equity and fairness, so in other words, trying to make sure that everybody is heard, that everybody has an opportunity is really important to me. And my, uh, my personality is um, such that I want to get things done quickly. So there are times when I will um, 
sideline somebody because they're a little bit slower in the way they deliver something or they think more slowly. Um, and I have to tell myself not to do that. You know, I have to tell myself to give them time. And one of the really fascinating things has been to, re to realize that um, in a crisis, very often the quietest people, are the people who will rise to the challenges and, and the difficulties. Um, and in fact, I, it, it, I've even seen that in during the early stages of the pandemic when we went into lockdown number one, one of the organizations that I work with, um, there were a couple of people who were characteristically always the quietest people in the room. And it was so fascinating to see how they rose to um, be constructive, really involved, and um, just you know, um, engaged at the right time to deliver what was necessary. Um, and I found that absolutely fascinating. So, you know, terribly quiet ordinarily because everything is going well, they don't need to make a noise. Um, not the loudest person in the room. And so therefore not necessarily the sort of person that I would ordinarily take much notice of. So the, the important thing for me is to try and tell myself, pick me as a chair when I'm chairing, to try to make sure that I'm bringing everybody in, to try and make sure I'm listening to everybody, that I'm getting around to everyone. Mm -hmm. And when I was um, chair of Action Aid, um, and we decided that we had to listen better, there were, we, we'd, we'd actually decided that one of the things we should do is to um, listen to young people better. Because it's very easy for middle-aged people to think that they know everything and young people have no experience, so therefore they should be quiet. So we very deliberately got two people under the age of 25 onto the board. Mm. And it was fascinating because other charitable organisations said, well, that doesn't make any sense because they won't have the right experience. And we said, if you always go for experience, you will never get diversity. Um, you know, you bl block out all the women who've never sat on a board before and all the ethnic minorities who've never sat on a board before. So you might actually be disengaging huge amounts of talent. And what you should be doing is actually saying, can we organize ourselves so we're not using jargon? Can we organize ourselves so that the historic aspects of the organization are easily explainable? Can we organize ourselves so that the policy is always visible? So that people who are coming in afresh are not disadvantaged. You're make, creating equity and fairness in terms of opportunity and understanding. Brilliant. Then they can engage appro appropriately. Yeah. Can you? Can, do we have proper mentoring so that people can feel supported? And then also the other thing was, don't bring in only one of the person, one young person. Have two, because it, it's quite daunting being in a cohort of people who are all different from you. And you might, if you are thinking differently, think, oh, Craggy, I see this differently. Is it just me? And it, it, it could be that what you're thinking is really revolutionary and really important, but that everybody else hasn't seen it because they're all coming from the same perspective. If you have at least one person who's, who's either you know, another young person or another ethnic minority or another person, just from a, you know, that, that's, that, same, that same perspective, that you're from it may well be that that could give you the courage to speak out where you might not otherwise that's brilliant do so that's brilliant uh, and and that so fits with uh, i encourage uh ceos and their boards to have reverse mentoring by people who are in their 20s uh and also from different ethnic and diverse backgrounds uh, and orientations and and also um so I think what you, you describe is brilliant. And, and um, so organizations have done that and, and it's worked incredibly well. Uh, this one guy, uh, Martin, who's at the Sanger Institute, part of the Wellcome Trust, he's the COO, Martin Doherty. And, and he's got uh, somebody who's very different from him, both in ethnic background and also in age. And she reverse mentors him on the board and comes to board meetings. Uh, and she's learning and he's learning. And, and she has a voice. And the other thing is, you've probably come across that lovely book by Susan Cain called Quiet in a World That Never Listens in praise of introverts, where the introverts in the thinking environment style that Nancy tra trains, uh, where you have a round and everybody has a minute to speak. Yes. 
yes. um, allows the quieter ones to come up with the solutions and they have some brilliant solutions. Um, Absolutely. This is fantastic. Um, I've got my puppy who's trying to chew my shoe now. Um, and then purpose, uh, PQ is the next one round. What gives your life meaning and purpose, your sort of dharma, your vocation, your calling? So tell us a bit about that. Um, yes, I suppose my mantra is redress the imbalance and all else will follow. Um, mm. And so it really sort of leads on from, from what we were discussing earlier. Mm. If we can create an Im improved environment for others, um, access to education, access to opportunity, then they can find um, their own, they can build their own resilience. They can find that, make, build their own, their own path. Mm. Um, and, and that's the best thing that you can do for anybody is, to, is, is actually to help them to become resilient. Um, it, it's, it, it's, um, it's, it's the way to make sure that you're actually destroying the circle of um, poverty. It's really, really hard for people to break out of that unless we as a society give somebody within that community the ability to build a resilience, a, a, a strength, an opportunity, so they can start to become innovative, so they can start to become entrepreneurial in their own right. It's really fascinating. What One of the things that got me on this track was I, I remember when, when, when I was younger, as all young people do, young children do, being told about ancient Egypt, and for me, the fascinating thing about ancient Egypt wasn't the fact of the building of the pyramids, because that was just an expression of wealth. For me, it was the fact that every year, the, um, the, the basin of the Nile flooded the terrain and the, the area became very, very fertile. And as a consequence, it was known as the breadbasket of the, the region. And that was what gave them the ability to forge ahead in terms of mathematics, in terms of geometry, in terms of their incredible building, in terms of um, building their, their uh, um, culture and their writings and, 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 and so on. Because they had the opportunity and the education um, that came out of the confidence of knowing that they're always going to be fed. So if you create that hinterland, you address the imbalances, mm. everything else follows. Okay. People can become creative, they can become innovative, they can become entrepreneurial, they can build their own resilience if they don't have to worry every day about how they're going to feed the children. Mm. And that, that's so powerful. And that leads nicely as a segue onto health and well-being, food and things like that. Just thinking about your own health and well-being as a very busy leader yourself with many demands on your time and you clearly only sleep one hour a day because i don't know how you fit it all in <laughs> but what do you fast. <laughs> what do you do margaret to to look after your mental and physical health and well-being and model it for others because they're learning you they're not learning what you're saying they're learning how you're behaving T tell me it's a really 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 important thing to make sure that you have um support outside of the workplace in terms of family or friends that you can just spend time with that isn't work time and I'm very lucky I've got a husband I've got a daughter we have a dog <laughs> um, <laughs> and, and and we just do simple things together like we walk on Exmoor uh, which is one of the most beautiful parts of the world mm. um, we 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 do what my my family did when I was young we talk around the dinner table and they are, they're my team, they're my resilience. Um, you know, at the end of each day, we always ask each other, how was your day? And there's commiserations over the bad bits. There's jumping up and down over the good bits. There's hugging when hugging's necessary. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's, it's, it's making sure you have your own unit. And it may be that your unit is actually in your workplace. And I've had... PAs who have been the most astonishing support to me um, and you know, some of my PAs I literally feel I owe them my life because there have been times that have been so dark 
um, that, and you know, I, I do suffer from depression and I make no bones about it because um, it helps people to know that um, everybody has their, you know, their downtime and um, it's, I have coping mechanisms that so that others don't know, so that, you know, for example, I have a uniform and um, I can remember all, uh, on one occasion when I was really, really depressed and I very, very rarely would ever take my depression to the doctor. But on this particular occasion, it was so bad that I went to the doctor and she said to me, you don't look depressed. And I said, well, what does a depressed person look like? Mm. And she said, well, for a start, you look incredibly smart. And and I thought, well, that's really funny because that's part of my coping mechanism. I have my black polo neck jumper. I have my special jacket. I have my pearls. I have my, you know, and I, I and I, you know, I, I wear my uniform mm. so that nobody can tell what's happening on the inside. Mm. Um, and, but, but it's so interesting that even despite that, the people who really know you can tell if there's something wrong. Yeah. And um, I've had PAs who've said, you know, are you all right? Can I do this? Can I do that to help? Because, um, you know, I can see that, that, that it's that, 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 that it's getting you down at the moment. So it's important to have people who really know you, people who are there for you. Um, and and then also the, just having some physical activity. So I do, um, I still do by ballet warming up exercises. Um, and now that now with a fantastic woman who has women of a certain age that she she, te she, she teaches and, uh, we all um, have a little session at the end when we discuss our our communal aches and bits <laughs> uh, so it's not quite as the belly exercises I used to do when I was younger at uh, Covent Garden and um, uh, but still really wonderful um i play the cello from time to time when i'm really woeful at it but i love music i love the arts written and spoken word um so just having things that take you away from the the work is really really important yeah but also it's really important to do things you enjoy mm. um just uh if you are fortunate enough to be able to work in something that you enjoy it just keeps you going so even if your body is letting you down, because depression is caused by a chemical imbalance. Um, so there's nothing you can do. People can't say snap out of it because there's nothing you can do about it. But if you work in something that you enjoy, there will be bits of it that you can still be doing, even on days when you can barely put one foot in front of the other. Yeah. This, this, is, this is very pertinent, uh, and I relate massively to it. A number of the clients that I have helped over the years, particularly during this last 18 months, have either been close to taking their own life or they've been very depressed and very anxious uh, and I've got them therapeutic help. I also myself this time last year when times were tough financially and we had the pandemic, I, I was in a place which was so dark I was thinking of suicide. So, but I found uh, as well as therapy that actually what I call habit stacking, positive habits and discipline in that has, has meant I no longer, uh, I can't afford the therapy, so I've stopped that. But what I found really helps me is I get up at a set time. So I always get consistent sleep. That sleep is the biggest help I find for, for therapy. I have a standing desk, as you can see, I'm standing now. Um, and, and standing a lot during the day really helps uh, reduce anxiety and depression. Oh, that's um, interesting. Yeah, it is. It's very interesting. Get yourself a standing desk. It, it has, uh, there's some research, I, I can't put my finger on it, but there is research about, it, it, it makes, I think, almost a 20% difference to people who are anxious or not, this ability to get off your bum and stand, mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. I'll sit down later on and I'll stand again uh, for another podcast I've got in America later on tonight. Right. Um, so, so, so I, uh, consistent time, eat, move, sleep, breathe, focus, prosper is, is the, the things we do that um, I listen to the Daily Stoic. So I find stoical philosophy very helpful. Um, so um, Marcus Aurelius, Epictetus, Seneca, some great words of wisdom, which Ryan Holiday has turned into the Daily Stoic. So I listen to it as an audio because I'm dyslexic. Oh, it's my right. way of listening. So that's the first thing I listen to. I'm not listening to the news or depressing stories about COVID or yeah. how the world is coming to a, 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 an untimely end tomorrow but I'm listening to things about controlling the controllables, which of course uh, in a uh, 
a, a previous relationship, someone I knew very closely was alcoholic. And so we all went to Al Anon. And so the, the, the serenity prayer is God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the, and wisdom, the wisdom to know the difference. difference. And absolutely. that is stoical philosophy, which is yes. about controlling the controllables. And so that begins the day well. I then do 20 minutes of uh, headspace mindfulness. It began at 10 minutes and, and I've been doing it for 50, uh, 80 days now. And, and, and I'm now at 20 minutes. And then I either do yoga or I do 30 minutes of fitness in my garage with a few weights. And then I walk the dog and then I start the day. Uh, and I also journal. And journaling has, I think, about a 15 to 20% reduction in anxiety and depression if you journal every day. The five minute journal.com is my lifesaver oh. and I, i've been running that for five or six years it's it's about 19 pounds on amazon and it begins with uh what you're grateful for because gratitude and appreciation is also a reduction of stress and yes. depression yes yes uh I, I talk about the three things i'm looking forward to in the day and a, a description of my identity who who i am or why am i well, fit fit healthy happy appreciative grateful thoughtful kind why am i because then the brain starts looking for well why am i oh because uh, uh, i do this because i do that that's me that's not me so sorry to major on it but it, it's it's transformed my life and the lives of many i've coached who've been in very dark spaces by having this discipline you don't need the drugs you don't need the therapy you're actually self self-medicating as effectively I don't know what thoughts come Gosh, up. Gosh, that, that, that's amazing. And um, uh, sorry, I'm sort of fading into the gloom. It's getting darker and darker. I just put the light on. Yeah, yeah. Um, that, that, perhaps I should pay you for all of that advice. That was incredible. <laughs> Goodness uh, me. It does that's work. Great. It genuinely does work. And I, I've made it a bit of a calling to help people with that. I'm not a therapist. Um, and I do recommend people go and see CBT based therapy uh, as well, which is very helpful. But there's an awful lot you can do based around your health and resilience and the eat so i'm i'm now on also the thing that's helped me as well my wife and i have gone on to intermittent fasting and the, and there's a oh, thing yes. called fast little app and i'm at the moment in the eight hours of eating phase which will finish at 7 30 tonight and then i'll go on to 16 hours of fasting which is very easy to do yes a, until yes. 11 30 the next day and that helps with ketosis for the brain and the thinking. Absolutely. So I think best in the morning when I'm not eating at all, just great ketosis. Yes. yes. And then uh, autophagy, which is the, 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 the destruction of old folded proteins and, and cancerous, potentially cancerous cells, which mm. it sort of breaks apart those cells and uses those bits to rebuild and keep you living longer. So there's, there's great um, research in that as well. So anyway, you got me off on clearly a favorite topic, but back to yes, you, Margaret, enough of me. Let's, because um, because you're a busy lady and you've got other things to do. We're just in the last few minutes. And I just wondered if, what would you like uh, your legacy to be of, of the work you've done and your family and things like that? What would, what would you like people to say about you when, when, when your time has come to an end? Because that is the only uncertainty we have. We all know we will come to pass. Yeah, absolutely. Um, oh gosh, that's really difficult because um, I just want to have left behind something that was is worth leaving behind. So, in other words, um, uh, I, I suppose if I've if I if, if if it's really clear that I've created opportunity for other people, I've passed the baton on. In other words, then I would be happy if she passed yeah. the baton on. Yeah, I think that's lovely. Um, and and the last two things we're going to do uh, a book and then uh, a tip, which could be one you've mentioned already, but your favourite tip uh, that you you uh, recommend to leaders. But what what book have you found very good, particularly on the topic of diversity, equality, inclusion? Is there is there a there's probably so many you've read, uh, you're widely read, but what, what would you recommend to the listeners? Well, I'm going to cheat because this in in lockdown number one, that was a glorious sunny one. It was it, it was um because. I suppose it was this incredible space because I think we all thought it was going to be short. Um, I thought, oh my goodness, I haven't read my grandfather's book since you know, just for, for ages and ages and ages. And um, I, I decided to reread it and um, it's called Ethiopia Unbound. Um, and it's a, it's a very easy read because it's written in the form of a novel. And it's, a, it's, it, it, it's basically tells you about um, 
Well, I should explain that it's, the reason he called it Ethiopia Unbound is because he used Ethiopia as a sort of analogy for the whole of Africa. Because at that stage in 1911, when he wrote it, Ethiopia was the only country in Africa that had, wasn't colonized. And he was essentially saying, um, Africans, you need to um, own your own culture. You need to um, look to yourselves for strength and essentially come out from under. And he he, he wrote it, it's semi-autobiographical because it, it starts with the two young men meeting in, in Cambridge and, and, and um, he'd, he'd been an undergraduate at Cambridge. Um, and um, one's black and, and one's white. And, and they meet later in, in, in Africa. And it's, it's really interesting how the, 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 these two chaps who had been friends, the, 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 the young black man suddenly realizes that his, his erstwhile friend or friend in inverted commas really has an incredible innate feeling of superiority. And um, that uh, there's a distance between them created by that. Um, and it's a real exploration of what um, colonialism has done mm. to people who might otherwise walk side by side. Mm. Um, and so it's a fascinating, absolutely fascinating mm. book, because as mm. I say, it's written as a novel, but he goes back and looks at classics and, 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 and uh, um, draws analogies. And it, it's, it, it, so it's, it's, um, it's, even though it's a very, very easy read, it's actually very, very deep, and and I found it really quite inspiring as a mm. as a book. And, it, and 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 also because I was reading it just after the death of George Floyd, mm. it was it just seemed so extraordinarily um, timely. Brilliant to be reading it. So I, I that's what I would I would yeah. It's going to be flying off the. It's going to be flying off the Amazon shelves and being delivered in the coming weeks uh, in little cardboard boxes around the country to me as well. Um, Margaret, wonderful. Let's go for the final top tip. If you just perhaps introduce yourself again, as this is a, a standalone piece, and, and what your favourite top tip you'd give to uh, people listening. Um, right. Okay. So um, I'm Margaret Casley Hayford, and my top tip would be that we should all strive wherever we can to redress the imbalance whenever we see equality inequality whenever we see um, unfairness let's try and think about how we can open the door for others how we can send the lift down whatever the analogy is that you'd like to use um, if you get into the lift don't press the button only for yourself it may be that the person standing next to you could, could benefit with some help what floor do they want to get to help them to get there? Um, and as, so as far as um, uh, this inspiring leadership series is concerned, I just found it just such a joy being part of this conversation. And so my top tip is redress the imbalance and the Marvelous. rest will follow. Margaret, thank you. It's been an honor having you on the series. Uh, you have so much wisdom and experience to share. Thank you very much indeed. Well, thank you very much for asking me. It's been a huge pleasure. Thank you. Great.